In biology, the idea of a species is fundamental to talking about the diversity of life on Earth, to talking about endangered species and conservation. But how do species arise? What is a species? It turns out that's a messy question. And uh, there is a lot uh, to this. Now, uh, Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, uh, was foundational to this discussion, um, given that at the time the book was published, it was thought that it was impossible for new species to arise. So for example, his quote here, um, great is the differences uh, between the breeds of pigeon. I'm fully convinced of that all are descended from the rock pigeon. Um, and he gives the species, the wild uh, rock duck. Um, that doesn't surprise anyone that pigeons are modified descendants of doves. But he had to make that argument in the book, The Origin of Species. It was thought that all of the species which currently existed had, uh, that, that currently existed, had always existed, going back to the beginning of life on Earth, and that no new species could ever arise. And so Darwin's um, thoughts on the fact that new species do arise and how they could arise, um, this then lays the foundation for how we view the biological uh, world uh, today. Uh, now, as I go through uh, a number of uh, points in modern biology, um, certainly he noticed things like geography matters. And so certain species of flightless bird, like rheas, um, are native to South America, whereas if you went to other parts of the world, you would find, you know, the ostrich the, um, in Africa, the uh, emu or cassowaries uh, in, um, uh, in Australia. When he went to islands, like the uh, Galapagos Islands, uh, he saw that there were species native uh, to uh, these islands. And so uh, the idea that uh, geography plays uh, an important role, that was uh, something that he noticed uh, early on. Um, the idea that uh, the term species is a bit arbitrary. Where do you draw the line, say, between dog and wolf? Um, are they different species, as they were once considered? Are they subspecies? Uh, and so uh, while I'll be looking at it from kind of more of a modern biological perspective, it should be pointed out that Charles Darwin uh, raised a number of these issues in his book, The Origin of Species. So let's start off with two flies, which are identical, all right? So in this animation, uh, these flies start out the same. But let's imagine that there is a change over time. And in the previous um, video that I made talking about population genetics, the applications of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, populations do change over time. If these two are then two different populations, they start off being identical, but then over time they change, they change, they change. And maybe at a certain point we feel that we have a um, two different species. Uh, so at the beginning of this animation, they were identical. At the end, I think, you know, many individuals would classify these as different biological species. Um, but the point is that this can be a gradual process where you have two flies in one single population. And then you can have then one species, which we then divide into two, say, subspecies, which still can interbreed, but are uh, distinct to a large degree. Where maybe we recognize them as different species, but that they can still interbreed breed to a varying degree um, uh, and produce hybrid offspring, or then maybe at some point they no longer can interbreed. They're 100% um, separated. Uh, the point is, as biologists consider speciation now, it is a gradual process for the most part. And so therefore, as we look around us, we see populations which vary. We see populations which we call different subspecies. We see related sibling species. We see closely related species which are incapable of breeding together. We think that speciation is going on around us all the time. This 
video is going to um, overview than a lot of the, the shorter videos that I have, um, which then go through how this happens and some of the factors which can be involved. Although, for example, the processes which were involved in the speciation of, say, these two frogs could be different than the speciation of two other frogs or of those flies or fish, etc. So obviously not all of these points are always applicable um, in the process of speciation. In the previous uh, video on the Hardy-Weinberg uh, uh, equilibrium, I said that evolution does not have to happen. All right, and so let's say that you have a population of dogs uh, with a rare uh, green variant. All right, so this is a population of dogs. You could come back thousands of years in the future and find the dogs looking exactly like this with the frequency of the green morph being the same as it is today. But as we had gone over with the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, there are conditions that need to be met. The population has to be infinitely large. There has to be no net immigration or emigration. Um, mutation rates have to be balanced, etc. And so, if those conditions apply, you would never say have a green species of dog, all right? Um, because populations don't have to change over time. But those conditions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, they don't have to be met. Populations can be small. Um, there can be genetic bottlenecks. There can be founder effects where small groups found new populations. There could be net migration in and out of the, um, uh, the population. Um, there can be all of these things discussed in the previous uh, video, which can cause populations to change over time. Now, um, how could this result in a new species? Well, once again, I, uh, this is just you know, kind of a frank discussion of, um, of, of biology, and just part of the frank uh, discussion is just how messy this is. So for example, let's take dogs. Um, dogs are considered to be a subspecies of, uh, of wolf, Acanus lupus domesticus, uh, but let's just say hypothetically that uh, dogs are a, uh, a species um, and uh, we know that they can interbreed. All right, so big breeds of dogs and little breeds of dogs, we don't separate them into reproductively isolated groups. Instead, they can all interbreed. We consider this to be um, a subspecies. It was uh, formally considered a species. Now, let's say that I'm happy with that. Here, you know, the dogs, they're a subspecies. Um, yeah, but what is the definition of a species? The definition of a species, I mean, it can vary. We have different ones that we can apply to different groups. So for example, we're trying to figure out what's a fossil species or an asexual species, that's you know difficult. But we could say a group of populations that can reproduce together under natural conditions. That's a definition that many people are comfortable with. So let me repeat, a species is a group of populations which can reproduce together um, under natural conditions. And this would mean that all of these were in the same, you know, a species with uh, the wolf. Under natural conditions, they can uh, reproduce. Okay. Now, um, we could change this, however. Um, so let me just say that the history of dogs was different from what it is. Uh, that what well, it now is. Let's say that, I don't know, an, an ancient group of, of uh, people um, had bred this breed of dog 80,000 years ago, but then 60,000 years ago, the, you know, the culture changed, and then this breed of dog was no longer um, uh, alive. And then said from 50,000 years ago, uh, in another part of the world, that breed of dog was produced, etc. That let's just hypothetically say that instead of all of these dog breeds coexisting today in the world, that let's just say that different cultures at different points in history had bred these dogs, but that the dog breeds, you know, didn't last forever, that they lasted, you know, uh, with a, a civilization. Um, so then the question is, how many species of dog would there be? 
Well, if our definition is that they are reproductively isolated from each other, then the problem would uh, then um, uh, be, yeah, I'm sorry, this bar gets in the way, um, that they lived at different times. So the Great Dane never had a chance to reproduce with the poodle, which never had a chance to, to breed, uh, uh, breed with the chihuahua, et cetera. Could you make the argument that instead of one species, that they're now different? The dogs themselves have been changed, all right? But just, you know, some of the, you know, uh, characteristics of like the time that they lived. Or let's just say people didn't uh, transport dogs from place to place. And that here we had, you know, a dog over here, a dog over here, a dog over here, and that this breed was only found in this part of Africa, this breed only in this part of South America, or uh, Mexico, or Canada, etc. If people did not transport these dogs, this dog obviously would never migrate to here or there. And so could we then make the argument that they would then be reproductively isolated because they would never under natural conditions interbreed? In that case, could we make the argument that the very same dogs were now one, um, instead of being one species, were now multiple species? What would happen if, let's just say, um, there were now differences uh, where there were some chromosomal differences uh, between uh, the dogs, which would mean that poodles could breed among themselves, um, but they could no longer uh, produce fertile offspring with a group that had a different uh, number of chromosomes. Would that then make them a new species? What happens if one dog breed only made it in fall while another one only made it in spring? They would then be reproductively isolated. They would never interbreed. All right, what happens if one came out at night and one came out in the day? The point is, if you just modified some of the aspects of dog physiology, you could make the argument, instead of having one big variable species, that now you would have multiple species. It's messy. Now, as I go through how messy this is, I like to, from time to time, just remind us of ourselves. I mean, it's great to think about other species, but everything that, you know, we just, you know, are, uh, uh, that, you know, applies in this applies to humans as well. We are a biological species, and there have been other species of humans, Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalus, you know, um, uh, etc. Um, and so, how did, how do new species arise? Well, as with those dogs, one of the keys is to be isolated. So you notice that you know, one group was isolated in time or isolated by geography or isolated by um, uh, the time uh, in which uh, they breeded and uh, they bred. Uh, and so if we have all of these different uh, human species, some of which you know, um, you know, live in different parts of uh, the world or at different uh, times um, with Australopithecines. Um, we could then uh, point out that one of the things that often plays a role in speciation is geographic separation. So whether um, when we talk about you know, modern species, it's this way, but hominids, there are species which we recognize which are only known in South Africa or East Africa or Asia or the island of Flores, all right? And so um, when we look at where do we know different um, uh, species in our group, so once again, you know, there are uh, different places, we give them different species names, um, but then geography clearly is playing uh, a role, all right? And so, you know, even, you know, there's this one very uh, short species, the adults reaching maybe three feet in height on the island of uh, Flores, as we will get to. So one of the things that seems to be key in the formation of a new species is isolation. Um, because, as was covered previously, um, populations will change over time. That's a mathematical certainty because the mathematical conditions that one needs um, for species not to change, the infant uh, population size, the random mating, the lack of selection, et cetera, it doesn't occur. So populations will change over time, there is no doubt about that. It is mathematically impossible for populations not to change over time because the mathematical conditions you would need for that to happen, those conditions are not met. But then we often then notice that uh, uh, 
while populations are changing on time, uh, over time, the changes occurring, say, in uh, Africa uh, are different from those in South America or in this part of the world. So one of the ways that new species arise, right, like this turtle from the Galapagos Islands, which Darwin would have noticed, is that its ancestors changed, the ancestors um, elsewhere in the world uh, changed, um, but that the changes were now geographically uh, isolated and so that they ended up being different. So what's called allopatric speciation um, or allopatric isolation is when geography separates populations. So once upon a time, all of the continents were uh, fused and you could have some uh, reptiles like Lystrosaurus, you know, found all over the world. But then the continents separated. And so uh, there are many groups which are only known from southern continents or northern continents or, you know, this part of uh, the world. So geographic isolation, whether we talk about, you know, the history of land vertebrates, whether we talk about human ancestors, or whether we, you know, talk more recently. Um, you know, here uh, there's uh, groups uh, which um, uh, can be found along the southern uh, continents along uh, in Gondwana, um, but not in the uh, northern um, uh, continents. So ge geography and uh, geographic isolation matters. So um, the separation of different parts of the world, the separation of say one region because there's a mountain range that splits two habitats or you know a big river uh, or an island, um, these are important. And if you were to ask why are there so many different groups of birds alive today, um, we'll notice as we run through the different um, uh, groups that some only known some bird families, all of the species, known only in New Zealand or New Zealand and Australia, or some are, uh, you know, uh, only in the old world or primarily in the new world. So geography matters. And um, if we're asking what could separate two populations so that the changes in population one is different from uh, the changes in population two to the point where now they may have trouble uh, reproducing together, uh, geography can play a role. Oceans, mountains, rivers, and this is what's known as allopatric isolation. It is also possible for organisms to be in the same general geographic region, but still be isolated. This then is what's known as sympatric isolation. So once again, if two populations are in the same general area. So it's not like one is North America, one is South America, or one is mainland and one is continent. They could also, they could both be say, the state of New York. They could both be Brazil. Um, so uh, they're in the same geographic region, but they're still isolated. This is what's known as sympatric isolation. And there are different classes. Um, I'll give multiple examples as I go on, but let me just kind of begin with, you know, human ancestors. We think our ancestors, one important step was that um, there were apes living in uh, East and Central Africa, um, and that while some still stayed in trees, all right, uh, others were now spending more time on the ground. You know, and this, they were adapting to tougher material in their diets, etc. Um, but this is what would be called habitat isolation as two groups then became more and more adapted to do different habitats, one in the trees and one um, uh, out of uh, the trees, then uh, they would then be less likely to reproduce together, would be more isolated from each other um, because of what's called habitat uh, isolation. Um, there are other things which could isolate uh, individuals. So for example, uh, mechanical, isolation. Uh, for example, in arthropods, it's often seen that two, you know, populations which might be able to interbreed hypothetically can't simply because their genitalia don't fit, all right, so that the changes in their body form and shape have included such that they're just mechanically unable to reproduce. So in arthropods, one can see this. Um, but then when uh, one considers our group, and once again asks, you know, in human ancestry, might mechanical isolation have played some role in the separation of our ancestors from uh, related 
uh, populations. Um, one notes a couple of things. Uh, one is there are big differences between, say, the uh, hips of chimpanzees versus the hips of Australopithecines and then later Homo. All right, and so um, maybe uh, as far as just physical differences in reproducing together, um, there would have been uh, some mechanical isolation as some organisms adapted their hips for upright walking while others uh, were uh, adapting uh, their hips for a quadrupedal uh, locomotion. Um, uh, uh, certainly, if organisms are of different size, Homo floresiensis was a species of human that reached three feet uh, uh, as adult heights. Now, not only were they isolated on an island, all right, that's an allopatric isolation, but also just the change in size. If individuals, which, you know, one is almost half the size of another, um, if they meet, they might not be able uh, to breed because of mechanical isolation. So in the same general area, perhaps, but unable to mate. Uh, so it's a form of sympatric isolation known as mechanical isolation. Um, flowers bloom at certain times of the year. And if, say, a flower bloomed in May and another flower bloomed in July, even if they were in the same area, these populations would then essentially be isolated from each other because never would the pollen from the first type of flower be landing on the second type of flower. So that's what's called a form of sympatric isolation known as temporal isolation. So sympatric isolation, because things can be isolated even when they live in the same general area, but they're isolated because of time. Maybe their mating season uh, varies. So, you know, there might be birds. Some mate in fall, some mate in uh, spring. Well, even if they traveled together or lived near each other, they would then be temporarily isolated uh, from uh, from uh, each other. If you had two populations, one you know came out in the day and one came out at night, once again, perhaps temporarily uh, isolated uh, from uh, each other. So that's another form of uh, sympatric, um, uh, sympatric isolation. In many species, um, there is some sort of a courtship uh, aspect uh, to reproduction. So there may be a song uh, which is uh, sung, uh, or there may be uh, a, a flashing of light, say, in a jellyfish, uh, or I'm sorry, in lightning bugs. Uh, there, uh, here's a courtship song in Drosophila. Uh, there uh, may be uh, certain uh, behaviors, you know, certain movements of, you know, feathers, you know, et cetera. But in any case, um, if there are two different populations and they sing different songs, or the males uh, perform different courtship dances, um, then this might be uh, something which uh, isolates them uh, behaviorally. And so two individuals could be in the same area, but nevertheless be behaviorally isolated. Once again, this is just guessing, but might some of that have applied uh, in our ancestry as well. Uh, just saying that um, the typical scenario of male apes is to have very large canines. Now, that would certainly um, affect group dynamics uh, and potentially aggression, um, but also if individuals were coming out of the trees and chewing tougher foods that would occur in the grassland, big canines would interfere with chewing. But now if a group loses the canines, um, would this, this then affect, you know, behaviors in a way that now two populations, if they're now acting uh, differently, uh, would now be uh, behaviorally uh, isolated in a way that would uh, reduce the likelihood uh, that they would, um, that they would interbreed. All right, so I'll be, you know, getting back to all of this, uh, but isolating populations is key to having the differences that population one undergoes um, be different from the uh, uh, different uh, the changes that population two undergoes. Um, some of the isolating mechanisms uh, can uh, affect the populations after mating has actually occurred. So maybe, uh, as we'll see presently, that there are chromosomal ass, uh, issues or genetic uh, issues uh, so that um, embryos fail, that they do not come to term. 
uh, so that um, mating occurs, right? But maybe the sperm don't fuse with the ova, or they do, but the embryos don't begin to divide, right? So maybe there are different numbers of chromosomes. Here, if you look within just this family of lemurs, they're all lemurs, right? And a, a family of lemurs, but look, they can vary in the number of chromosomes. Here's another family of lemurs. They can vary in the number of chromosomes. They can vary. Here's a number of new world um, monkeys. They can vary. Um, here's a number of old world monkeys. Here are different kinds of gibbons. They can vary in chromosomes. And so even after, say, sperm and ova fuse, um, then embryos might fail because of other uh, considerations like numbers of, um, uh, of chromosomes. Once again, this might be relevant to our lineage because if you compare uh, the human genome to that of chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, we have a really big chromosome too, um, where chimps and orangutans and uh, gorillas don't. They have two chromosomes, which apparently fuse together to make our human uh, chromosome uh, two. Okay, so before I start to apply this, I just wanted uh, to point out that isolation is key. So if you ask how could one species become two species, well, some sort of an isolating mechanism uh, is, uh, is key. And that could be geography in allopatric um, speciation, but it could also be differences in behavior, differences in genitalia, which don't uh, fit uh, well uh, together. Uh, it could be differences in habitat, differences in the timing of mating, uh, et cetera. Um, and then there are all of these other uh, features um, so that uh, in this population, you can see some of the flies have a, a yellow body and white eyes, uh, while others uh, have the wild type condition of a tan body and red eyes. So genes can change these aspects of uh, the species. Um, but there are actually genes which are known to interfere with the ability to mate with other populations. So why can't Drosophila melanogaster produce viable offspring with um, Drosophila simulans? There are actually genes which are known that, you know, this gene affects body color, this gene affects eye color. This gene affects the likelihood that hybrids can meet, uh, the hybrids uh, can uh, survive uh, together. Okay, so the world is full of species. And if one were to just consider all of the frogs, say, of uh, you know, Paraguay, um, there are far more frogs in, in Paraguay than there are in the United States. Look at all of these species. There are so many species of insect. There are so many species of uh, nematode worm, et cetera. Um, why? All right, so how does, um, uh, how does this uh, happen? Well, once again, um, as discussed with the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, Populations will change over time. They will, all right, because the infinite population size, the lack of selection, the lack of, you know, um, or, or I'm sorry, non random mating and other things, all of the things that you would need for populations not to change don't occur. So populations will change over time, all right, their genes will change, their anatomical um, uh, uh, conditions will change, uh, etc. And some of these changes might affect, say, hair color or blood type and really have no you know, effect on speciation. Um, but then some of these uh, then may um, contribute. Uh, once again, uh, this could happen in one population or uh, over time, or it could happen in two populations which are now separated from each other. So they could be separated uh, allopatric, uh, allopatrically if geography separates them, or they could be separated sympatrically if they live in different habitats, they have different mating behaviors, they mate at different times, they have mechanical isolation. All of this would be things which would separate them prior to uh, mating. But then there could also be things that uh, would happen after uh, mating, like um, and the zygotes failing, et cetera. Now, um, I have some videos where, you know, I, I pursue possibilities here, but look at all of these human species. I mean, it's interesting to talk about frogs or birds or fish, but there are many, you know, human species. This applied to us as well. 
So at some point, our ancestors produced multiple species. And so all of these principles in uh, speciation, uh, these then are um, of interest as well. And it is quite likely that allopatric isolation, habitat isolation, and others then played a role uh, in our uh, ancestry as well. Now, um, at the genetic level, when populations change over time, this very often means that there are now differences in the genes and differences in the chromosomes. I'm just going to just define chromosomes. Um, chromosomes can actually be visibly different in structure, all right? So there are lots of different kinds of mutations um, that then become typical of a population. So just like some populations of birds have a different color than, uh, than normal, some populations of birds have a slightly different um, aspect of their chromosomes. Uh, and so, for example, there can be deletions, excuse me, where some parts are lost. There can be duplications where there is now, you know, double the amount of uh, genetic uh, information in some sections. There can be inversions where some uh, portions of chromosomes uh, flip upside down. There could be translocations where a piece of one chromosome is then uh, attached uh, to another uh, chromosome. And these happen frequently. So, for example, it's known in humans that, you know, some people have a deletion chromosome, some people have an uh, inversion. Uh, sometimes this, you know, causes a clinical con condition that they then seek uh, help for. Sometimes this is a problem in, um, in causing infertility, um, but it arises in humans. And when we compare one population to another, um, very often it is differences in chromosomes uh, which are making it hard for two populations then to reproduce together. So uh, there um, are quite uh, often um, differences uh, in chromosomes. And so when two populations try to uh, mate, uh, a problem, say for example, um, with uh, horses and uh, donkeys, um, when they try to uh, reproduce, that uh, their offspring, while mules are alive, they are usually sterile. And that's because their parents have different numbers of chromosomes. And if your parents have different numbers of chromosomes, that means that the hybrid offspring might have too few chromosomes, too many, and this can affect gene dosage. It can affect how much gene product you make. Um, now, obviously, that can affect, you know, like an entire chromosome, but it can also then be the case if, you know, one part of one chromosome is deleted or duplicated. Now, the hybrid offspring would then have too many genes, too few genes, etc. Um, inversions uh, often make it hard uh, to reproduce because then uh, hybrids uh, very often then are um, are sterile or may fa uh, fail to uh, develop uh, because of uh, the problems uh, which arise when chromosomes uh, cross over. So notice that um, here is an individual who has two chromosomes. Maybe the mother's population has the bands oriented this way, the father's um, uh, population has their chromosomal bands oriented this way. Uh, when uh, this individual then, having all the right genes, they have chromosomes with all the same genes, but because an inversion has occurred, whenever then they try to make ova or sperm, then very often some of their sperm um, have uh, duplications, too many gene sections or deletions, or they could, um, in a different uh, scenario, have uh, chromosomes without uh, a centromere uh, or uh, chromosomes uh, with two centromeres. Um, and so uh, populations will change over time. But apparently one of the big changes which leads to speciation are changes in chromosomes. And so um, uh, it is just normal in populations, including humans, that variations in, hum in chromosome number uh, arise in variations in uh, chromosome structure arise. Uh, but when we compare one, um, 
at one species to a neck, uh, to a, a closely related species, we very often see that um, they uh, have differences of chromosomes, uh, which are then making them separate because uh, uh, they have trouble uh, reproducing together. So once again, these chromosomes, they have the same genes, but there is an inversion. And if um, individuals who now have uh, chromosomes uh, which differ in this inversion, when this individual tries to make sex cells, sperm and ova, a lot of them don't work very well. One final type of chromosomal abnormality um, is that uh, you can have polyploid individuals which have extra chromosomes, say two sperm fertilize an ovum or two pollen, uh, pollen grains fertilize an egg. You would end up with extra chromosomes. Now, um, although uh, in many animals, uh, this is typically fatal in humans, this is typically fatal having a whole other uh, set, although uh, with rarer uh, frequency individuals uh, can be born alive um, briefly, say if they have three copies of each chromosome. We know in nature it's common enough that you have closely related species um, where clearly a polyploid event has occurred. So in this uh, tree frog, there are 24 chromosomes in diploid cells, while in this tree frog, there are 48 chromosomes in diploid cells. And so um, here's a chromosomal uh, accident um, uh, a polyploidy, uh, which uh, can lead to speciation. Whereas now, if there's an accident and one of the you know, resulting populations then has you know, uh, the wrong number of uh, chromosomes, then uh, uh, it's hard for them to reproduce together. Okay. So I'd like to kind of, you know, kind of start to, to bring this together and, and get to the point where new species uh, arise. So let's say that there's a population of flies and that the population changes over time. Fine, we expect that that will happen. But if parts of the population are isolated, maybe by geography or behavior or habitat or something, then this population could change over time in a way different from this population. And so then you could ask, well, They've been different for a while. Should they have sex? All right. Is it a problem if they try to mate together? Well, maybe in this first case, no. Even though if this fly is a little different from this fly, I mean, look at their chromosomes. They're, they're still mostly the same. So maybe it's just fine. However, if populations change over time, sometimes if you say, well, now let's look at this population, clearly there is more genetic difference. Should they have sex? Should they mate? Maybe not, because maybe we've gotten to the point where if they do try to mate, the genetic differences are such that the offspring won't be healthy, that the offspring won't survive, that the offspring might be infertile, that a number of things might uh, happen. So if this population is changing over time and this population is changing over time, after a point, they then might have changed so much that now reproducing together is a problem. And so I asked my classes, all right, look at these, and just, you know, should they mate or no? And so a lot of students would say, sure, you know, um, you know, uh, they can mate. Oh, wait, no, look at the gene order. See, it's red, blue, green, yellow. Look at this, it's red, yellow, green, uh, blue. Um, so this would be an inversion. And even though all of the same genes are there, if they had offspring, the offspring then might be infertile um, as uh, a result, uh, because when crossing over occurs between inverted regions, um, uh, then the offspring, um, any embryos uh, conceived with those gametes uh, would be likely to fail. And so if you were to then look at these different pairs and ask, should these fish mate? Should these snakes mate? Um, well, if they're genetically comparable, then odds are, if they tried to mate, you know, odds are it would be successful. But if you say, oh, look, this one, there's been a translocation of chromosome for a part of the pink chromosome has ended up 
uh, here on the green chromosome. This is a genetic change. This population changed over time. This gen population changed over time. But they've changed the point now that reproducing together, well, that actually might be a uh, problem. Maybe they would be better off not reproducing together because their offspring might die or might not be healthy or might be infertile, et cetera. And then the same thing with these frogs, these snakes, et cetera. Populations change over time. But then if later populations which have been isolated then have the chance to reproduce together, um, sometimes it would work just fine. But sometimes the genetic differences which have arisen are such that, you know, the, the fusion of two chromosomes to make one big one. Now that if they tried to reproduce together, it would not be successful. Right? So if speciation is a process, here we are in the middle of the process with populations which have changed in different ways. And so now if they try to reproduce together, the offspring are at a disadvantage. Maybe not in this case because they look you know, about the same, you know, but then we could have another uh, possible scenario where um, we have uh, a different uh, uh, chromosomes. And so the offspring would be at a disadvantage. Um, they might not even survive uh, in such a mating between these uh, groups. Okay. So then what? Well, if we have these two populations, and they have changed over time in a way that now reproducing together doesn't work as well. We often now see that there are other aspects which reinforce this isolation. And here's often where we get into the courtship songs, the courtship behaviors, etc. Because if females are choosier with whom they mate, if they're more likely to choose their own males, all right, which, you know, display the, the popular, the, the courtship song, or which have the coloration, or which produce the same pheromones as their, um, as their males, um, then you're more likely to not have those chromosomal differences, which might then uh, put the offspring at a uh, disadvantage. Um, and so um, we often then do find that female turtles um, are picky. They don't mate with any male turtles. They try to mate with only members of their uh, group, what we call their species. And the same with um, birds. Well, how do the females know? Well, this varies from case to case, um, but there may be a specific type of coloration which the males of this species has, say the yellow warbler, that makes them different from the other species of warbler, or a difference in the courtship song, where you can tell just by listening, this male belongs to this group because yellow warblers sing differently than yellow throats, etc. So if you were to ask, all right, so here are females down here, and they're all on the same pond in spring during mating season. Whom should they mate with? Well, there are wrong answers, right? This is odd for humans to think about because, you know, if you ever start dating, right? If you're dating someone, you know, who you think looks human, well, they are, all right? Because all other species that were closely related to Homo sapiens, they are no longer with us. Homo sapiens is the only species that looks human alive um, uh, today. So if you are in a relationship with someone who looks human, then they are, and you can be assured that this is a member of my species. But there are a lot of ducks on the pond, and a lot of them aren't um, the same species as these females. So mating with a male that is too different might mean that their eggs don't hatch, that their eggs hatch but the young don't thrive, that the, the young may be infertile. There are wrong answers. So how do these females tell? Well, this species has now evolved a mechanism which reinforces this isolation. Differences in the coloration of the males, which allows the females to be choosy and only choose those color patterns 
uh, of the males in that uh, group. So once we get to the point where two populations are genetically different enough that interbreeding puts the offspring at a disadvantage, then you see um, mechanisms which reinforce isolation, which try to keep them apart so that they don't interbreed. This could be differences in you know, the coloration of feathers, as you can uh, see here, or the differences in courtship song, or how lightning bugs um, flash, or in the pheromones that insects make, or the pheromones that mammals make, etc. So once again, um, the females would be better off if they um, were pickier with the males with whom they mated, because mating with uh, the wrong species of male would mean that reproductive um, uh, efforts were wasted, all right, that all of the energy uh, invested in uh, making uh, an egg, for example, would come to naught because the offspring uh, would not uh, survive. And so um, once the females, or once the situation has gotten to the point where they uh, are so different that the offspring uh, are at a disadvantage, uh, if there are hybrids between the two groups, then we often see mechanisms which reinforce uh, isolation. So females will have a preference for a certain courtship song. And this way she's, you know, uh, more likely than to mate uh, with uh, uh, the males of her group, say Drosophila melanogaster, as opposed to uh, the males of Drosophila simulans, which look identical, but which are a different species, and the offspring would be at a disadvantage. Um, so courtship song is obviously an auditory signal, um, but there can be different pheromones, different chemicals, which allow uh, the females uh, to distinguish. So mammals make different pheromones, insects make different pheromones. And so this could then be something which allows uh, the females uh, to uh, decide. This is now reinforcing um, a reinforcing isolation, where uh, as uh, differences accumulate in the two different populations. A difference in pheromones or courtship song is making it less likely that they will even mate together. This is a pre-zygotic isolation, right? So they're not even likely to mate and have a zygote um, because the females don't like the male's courtship song or pheromones, etc. Um, there's even something not uh, well understood known as cryptic female choice, where if two males mate with this female, um, the sperm of the males um, uh, uh, which are in the same species might have an advantage. Even though both species sperm are there, uh, there could be various secretions that the female's body can vary, um, uh, which would uh, increase the likelihood that one uh, uh, type of sperm uh, is then uh, favored. Um, we see similar things in, um, uh, in uh, flowers. So for example, let's say that pollen from multiple male flowers are then landing on the female parts of a flower. Sometimes nothing happens. The pollen grains don't sprout because of the chemical interaction um, between the, um, uh, the pollen grain and the female tissue. All right, and so females can be choosy and not allow pollen tubes to grow if the pollen came from a male that, uh, the fe uh, that was not in this species group. Or if different pollen grains are competing against each other, they have to grow through this long tube. That's why it's so long, right? So the female flower is making the male pollen compete against other male pollen with an advantage often going to the conspecific one. It will grow more easily through the, uh, the female tissue as opposed to the pollen from a different um, uh, species. And so uh, this is what's known as a prezygotic uh, uh, mechanism reinforcing isolation because now you're making it less likely that a different flower pollinate this so there won't even be a zygote um, simply because of uh, of these uh, mechanisms. Um, uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, issues, uh, then this would be a post 
uh, zygotic uh, mechanism is that if there are gene differences or uh, chromosomal uh, differences, uh, then this could mean that if the wrong pollen does uh, uh, pollinate uh, the female flower, that now the female is investing energy in seeds that aren't going to do well, right? Maybe the seeds fail. Maybe the seeds don't develop well because you know the uh, differences between these two different types of flower include uh, chromosomal structural um, uh, differences or polyploidy, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, and so this is uh, fascinating because lots of species then have multiple ways of trying to ensure that the only mating that occurs or the only fertilization that occurs is uh, given those which have the best likelihood of producing healthy offspring. So in these examples, these fish are mating and the reproduct uh, and the um, fusion of the gametes occurs outside the, the body's female. I'm sorry, outside the female's uh, body. Um, but uh, it can be noticed that not all fish sperm have an equal likelihood of fertilizing this egg. The egg can surround itself by chemical barriers that some sperm can penetrate more easily than others. So the um, female can be choosier about you know, which uh, uh, fertilization uh, events um, uh, occur. Um, after fertilization has occurred, um, how likely is it that the uh, chromosomes in the male pronucleus fuse with the uh, female pronucleus? Well, that can vary with different fish. And so uh, male fish of the same species might have an easier time uh, than uh, others. Uh, once again, there is this odd a poorly understood phenomena of female uh, choice. So even if different males mate with a uh, female, um, the female's body may favor some uh, sperm over others. So even you know once the, the sperm is inside the female's body, um, the females can change their responses in ways which affect uh, the survival of sperm, the motility of sperm. Um, females can change their gene expression based on which of the males uh, they mated with. Uh, they could change their reproductive secretions. They could modify uh, the timing of uh, their gamete uh, production, the release of their eggs. Females can store sperm, displace sperm, eject sperm. So even after mating has occurred, um, cryptic female choice allows um, for uh, females to be choosy and thus favor males of one population over, um, uh, over uh, another. Okay. Now, maybe these changes are occurring very gradually, all right? And when we look at you know, what we think is the evolution of, of new species, say over the fossil record, you know, we often you know, see very, very gradual changes. Uh, we call this gradualism. Um, but maybe some of these changes occur uh, in an instant or much quicker. So for example, if there was a genetic accident which made double the number of chromosomes, that would be something that happens in one generation. It wouldn't be a gradual change. You would have, in essence, created a new species with one polyploid event. Um, another thing that we see when we consider fossils is that instead of seeing things uh, change um, very gradually, there are periods of the fossil record where there is a mass extinction as there are horrible uh, volcanic eruptions, you know, in the Siberian traps, for example, which ended the Permian period. Uh, or when a meteorite falls uh, from uh, the sky at the end of the Cretaceous period. And so some of the things which uh, result in speciation um, are gradual events, and so speciation can be a gradual process. Um, but then also, whether it be sudden genetic events uh, or uh, sudden events in the fossil record, uh, this uh, could then um, a result in what's called punctuated equilibrium, where there would be a period of rapid change followed by you know, a period then of stasis. 
So as you know, start to wind down, um, let's say that now we have uh, two populations which we recognize as different species, all right? That they are reproductively isolated, they live in different places of the world. There's other things that reinforce their isolation, like differences in courtship song or in pheromones or whatever. So we recognize them as different species. But that doesn't mean that they still can't reproduce at least a little, all right? So, um, Domestic dogs still interbreed a little bit with wolves. It doesn't happen often, but it, it can happen. But then there can be uh, uh, some uh, hybridization between other uh, species of dog uh, as uh, well. And so even once we say, here are groups which are um, isolated, they are different species. Nevertheless, every now and then, there is an offspring uh, which is um, a hybrid of two things which we consider different species. So once again, um, here, uh, wolves can interbreed with coyotes. We consider them different species. They are. But once again, speciation is a process. It isn't, you know, this instant, you're different species. You know, getting back to some of those earliest videos, for a while you can have what are called sibling species capable of some reproduction together. So we know of cases where what we consider to be different dog species can interbreed, or um, different uh, foxes uh, can interbreed, uh, etc. So um, there is hybridization known uh, in dogs. Um, this uh, next bird is a hybrid falcon between a jur falcon and a peregrine falcon. Once again, we consider them to be two different species and they're separated. But, you know, separation can occur in degrees and it turns out that jur falcons and peregrines are not 100% um, uh, separated. They could still have some uh, hybridization possible between them. And it turns out that this is common. You know, we you know, know that there can be hybridization between polar bears and uh, grizzly bears, uh, for uh, example. We know of hybridization in birds in our area, golden winged warblers and blue winged uh, warblers. And so speciation being a process, there are then even once we get to the point where we consider we have different species, uh, hybridization uh, is possible uh, between uh, different uh, uh, species. Um, and so, you know, there are bear species known as pizzlies, for example, uh, which are uh, uh, hybrids between uh, polar bears and, uh, and uh, grizzlies. So speciation is a process and we see it happening all around us. Um, we see uh, populations which are clearly very similar. I mean, look at the differences between American toads and Fowler's toads. Here you have one wart, wart per dark spot. Here you have multiple warts per dark, uh, dark spot. So they look very similar. Most people wouldn't distinguish between them, but they're different species, all right? So they clearly have different mating songs. They don't mate in, um, in uh, the wild. Now, as fascinating as it is to talk about falcons or bears or um, uh, or uh, any other group, um, at some point we're also interested in ourselves. Because once upon a time, there were different species of humans. So we could ask the question for Africans, Indians, and uh, I'm sorry, Africans, Asians, and uh, Europeans, um, where did modern populations come from? And the answer is, well, there's kind of these two models where in one model you could say, um, what is uh, known as replacement. That Homo sapiens, which first appeared uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago, two to three hundred thousand years ago, wiped the other ones out. So that all of these other species that say used to live in Africa, there were different species of human which lived in Africa, that only Homo sapiens uh, has remained. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that once again, you can have hybridization. You can have populations which interbreed, all right? Uh, and it is possible then that um, uh, modern Africans could have then their origin from multiple groups. Now, we could call them different species, but once again, 
if um, they're reproducing together, then, then maybe calling them different species is inappropriate. We could ask the same question. Where do modern Asians uh, come from? Well, maybe when Homo sapiens reached Asia, then all of the other groups died out because there were other species that lived in Asia. Uh, and so maybe Homo sapiens is the only one that survived, all right? Or maybe that when Homo sapiens got to um, uh, Asia, uh, there were uh, humans already living there, and that Homo sapiens then interbred with these other species of, um, uh, of humans so that modern Asians would then have ancestry from multiple groups. Once again, we'd be tempted to call them different species, but if they're reproducing together, then maybe they're not different species. Maybe different species is the wrong term. And the same thing, when Homo sapiens first arrives in Europe, there were already people living in Europe. What happened? Well, if Homo sapiens replaced them, all right, then maybe the replacement model is, uh, holds. But if there was some interbreeding which uh, occurs, um, then uh, this idea of regional continuity. So just as there are hybrid, there is hybridization between different species of dog and bear and falcon and fruit fly and warbler, there can, uh, we think, be uh, hybridization between different species of humans. That when Homo sapiens spread out throughout the world and found that there were uh, older uh, populations of humans uh, which existed, that maybe there was interbreeding. And then as we look at the great diversity in the uh, human population uh, today, um, maybe uh, that some of us uh, have ancestry from multiple groups, you know, quote, multiple species. Now, before I get, you know, back into this, I just want to point out, this is not just this purely fictional consideration. Um, so here is my, um, uh, 23 and, and me uh, uh, results. Uh, and notice, so for, in my genetic information, uh, I have alleles or, uh, which are uh, inherited from Neanderthals. So most of this isn't, all right? But Homo sapiens, you know, arose as a separate species. But somewhere in my ancestry, there were, was interbreeding between members of Homo sapiens and members of Neanderthals. So what we consider to be two different species. But once again, if we're saying that the definition of species is reproductively isolated, once we have proof of, you know, to a certain extent uh, of, uh, of reproduction between two groups, do we really consider them different species? Um, but so here you can see that in my ancestry, there was hybridization. I am a hybrid to a degree between two different species. I have inherited genes from multiple separate populations, which we recognize as um, species. And this is um, typical in humans as far as, um, as, far as uh, we can uh, tell. So I'm sorry, let me just change the order here. So uh, just going back to what I had said about the replacement and continuity models, um, Homo sapiens sapiens, species that look like us, you know, with you know, this nice flat forehead, the absence of a, of a brow ridge, um, uh, which was different from uh, earlier groups of humans uh, whose skulls tended to be low and long with a more prominent brow ridge. Um, when uh, Homo sapiens first uh, arose, say by 200, uh, a thousand years ago. There were other species of human alive on uh, Earth. So there were Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalis, a group called the Denisovans in Central Asia, Homo floresiensis in uh, the island of Flores, Homo erectus still in Java until fairly recently, and then genetic evidence of even a couple of lineages which we haven't um, discovered um, yeah. So when Homo sapiens began to spread through the world, there were different species of humans. And we know that there was some hybridization. Now we can do two tests because when we think about fossils, um, we only have three types of human DNA that we can test for. Homo sapiens, you know, the modern uh, species, but there has also been DNA isolated from uh, Neanderthals, uh, Homo neanderthalis, and these Denisovans from Central Asia. 
And so we could go around the world and find people who's, you know, who live in certain parts of the world and say, do you have these three types of human DNA that we can test for? Now, maybe someday we'll find more fossils and can test for more, but up until now, these are these three. So if we asked a modern African, which of these three do you have? We would observe that 100% of their DNA is homo sapiens, and they do not have any Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA. If we were to look at the average European, one or two percent of their DNA would be Neanderthal, but none would be Denisovan. So the average European now has gotten genes from two species, uh, Homo sapiens, the majority, but also a little from ne Homo neanderthalis. Now, Asia is a huge continent, and if we were to then sample different populations from Asia, we might find one Asian with maybe one or maybe two, probably closer to one, percent of their DNA Neanderthal, but maybe one percent of their DNA Denisovan, all right? So here's three separate human groups. And in some uh, populations in Asia, um, such as in um, uh, uh, Southeast uh, Asia and Indonesia and uh, um, and New Guinea. Uh, one could find uh, now uh, Denisovan DNA representing, you know, 5% or more of the, uh, of the genome. So clearly, just as we can see hybridization between two different, uh, you know, types of, of dog, which we call different species or different bears or different, you know, uh, birds, um, there was hybridization between two different, you know, uh, multiple groups of humans. And some of us have DNA from more than one of these groups. So I have a silly little thing here where uh, two, a Neanderthal and uh, a Homo sapiens are uh, reciting some, uh, uh, some Shakespeare. But getting back to that question of in Romeo and Juliet, you had two different groups. And the question was, in essence, you know, are they, should they stay separate? Or can there, you know, be, um, you know, a marriage between the two groups? Well, at some point, the same question then arose between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, or between Homo sapiens and Denisovans, where once, you know, there were individuals who decided that they would um, have a partner of another uh, species. Um, and so therefore, just the whole word species is messy, all right, because it's a process. We see populations which are starting to accumulate changes, and maybe we consider them subspecies. But then we see things, uh, groups which we actually call different species, um, but they still are capable of hybridization. And you're going to have that in hybrid offspring with, you know, multiple uh, species being there. Um, uh, their uh, parentage. Um, and then you uh, can have, you know, what are called multi-species complexes. So let's imagine that, you know, one species diversifies in an area. Well, what would you say if this one could mate with that one, but not that one, and this one could mate with that one, but not that one? Um, once again, it, it's messy. So if you ask, where does the species end? Uh, very often, it's a matter of uh, interpretation where, uh, you know, uh, some offspring are fertile and healthy, some are fertile, but a little less than healthy. And then, you know, between two other populations, maybe the offspring aren't, you know, healthy at all. So uh, what we often see in uh, observing uh, nature is that we have these complexes of related species, but um, do you consider them uh, subspecies of, of one parent species, uh, sibling species capable of reproduction. Do you consider them, uh, you know, uh, distant uh, species? So it's messy. And then there's even further difficulties when you say, all right, well, what happens if we have something that's asexual, like uh, a bacteria or like many types of protists? If we're defining our species by who can mate together, what happens to those which don't mate with other organisms? How do you tell the difference between a species or a not? How do you tell the difference in fossils where obviously we can't see which individuals can mate which, uh, with uh, what uh, uh, other species? So, uh, final just couple thoughts. Um, the species is a fundamental unit in biology, but it, it's messy and difficult to apply in nature. Um, and we see speciation occurring in nature. Now, a lot of biologists study speciation and ask, 
how is it that two different species arise from an ancestral population? Many geneticists actually study speciation genes. They're actually saying, why is Drosophila melanogaster reproductively isolated from Drosophila simulans? Why are they two different species? What genes are actually doing this? And so if you wanted to read on um, uh, these, uh, uh, the results, there are actually genes which are known, which are contributing to these, um, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the speciation of these events. So, you know, for example, here's uh, one gene HMR, hybrid male uh, rescue. Uh, here's uh, another gene. There's a number of genes which are known, which are actually uh, contributing uh, to uh, this. And so speciation is something which is a natural uh, process. Um, so when Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, he introduced this idea that uh, species are not fixed that new species can arise. And today we understand the mechanisms of this uh, so well that we can actually study the isolation um, uh, which uh, uh, separates these populations so that they change genetically. Then the things which reinforce isolation once it gets to the point that the offspring would be um, uh, worse off in hybrids. And then even you know the speciation genes promoting this. Um, one final note. Um, because, you know, obviously it's difficult and some levels to talk about humans, but since, you know, the same biology applies to us as to other organisms, you could ask the question, since human populations all once did share an ancestry, but since they went to different parts of the world and were isolated for a long time, you know, humans who lived on this continent could be largely isolated from humans who uh, lived on another continent. Um, what happens now if humans from different parts of the world then try to intermarry and have kids together? Because at some point, genetically, this would be a problem where the genetic differences between two different human populations would have gotten to the point that the offspring might, you know, be infertile or unhealthy or, you know, the zygotes would fail and there would be more frequent miscarriages. Have the differences in human populations gotten to that point? And it's a legitimate genetic question because if populations are isolated long enough, at some point the answer would be yes. But at this point in time, have human populations isolated to the point where reproduction between populations is a problem? And the answer is a resounding no, with one exception as far as I know. The only example that one can give of human populations varying genetically in a way which now interferes with our ability to produce children together is in the case of the RH factor. If a mother is RH positive, then there's really no problem. Uh, the fetus could be RH negative or RH positive and the mother's immune system will not react to it. However, if the mother is RH negative, and a fetus is Rh positive because the father was Rh positive. While this won't cause a problem for the first fetus to be born, once the first fetus is born and the mother's immune system interacts with the Rh factor on fetal blood for the first time, the mother will then start to make antibodies. All right, so once this first interaction occurs at the first birth of an Rh positive child, the mother's immune system will start to make antibodies which will attack later fetuses which are RH positive. This can cause a number of complications, including the potential death of the fetus. So there actually was um, this example where, I mean, imagine a mountain range separates um, an RH positive and an RH negative population. Um, if people start crossing the mountain range and intermarrying, the RH negative women will actually attack through their immune system the fetuses fathered by RH positive fathers. This would be an example of there would then be an advantage in say females being choosier and now uh, finding a reason uh, to um, have offspring with uh, RH negative uh, fathers more so than RH positive fathers. Now in the modern world, uh, RH negative women are given a substance called Rogam at, uh, at birth and before birth. Rogam prevents that interaction. So um, 
because of Rogan, there is never that initial interaction where the mother's uh, immune system encounters uh, the, uh, the RH factor. And so then uh, there isn't uh, the danger that the mother's immune system attacks uh, the fetus. And so in the modern world, that is no longer an issue. But as far as I know, that is the only um, example that might suggest that our one human population was taking the first steps on fragmenting into different species of humans the way that has obviously happened before, given that in the past there were different species of humans. So species is a, you know, a central concept in biology, but it, it's messy. Um, and uh, we understand much of how new species arise, um, but which of these conditions is most applicable would vary, say, between these fruit flies or these primates or these flowers, et cetera. So this has been an overview of how the differences which are building up between populations which are isolated can then end up resulting in two different species.